the comedy guy on top half. I was the one who wore pink dungarees on camera. I was the one who set up ridiculous scenes at Hotel Divan where I did a complete piss take of, um, of some American drama where we had limousines and helicopters. And I mean, it was a fantastic era. The, the wonderful era of Top Half was that Ali Harley as our producer and John Harris and um, we had Philip Alpers for a short time. We pretty much could come up with our own concepts and go for it. And the pure pleasure of being able to do that, knowing you didn't have to worry about a budget, um, was pretty remarkable. I, I, I can remember one striking story that I did that um, it was about a Northland guy who just wanted to help youth and he'd set up this boot camp on 90 Mile Beach. And so we went up for a day and a half or whatever to work with these kids. And this was phenomenal. If you talk today about um, communities solving their problems. This guy knew that 20 years ago and he was awesome. However, <laughs> we wanted the chariots of fire shots with the helicopters, you know, opposing shot, helicopter flying, boys running, length of 90 mile beach. It wasn't an issue. So we, we got the helicopter and off we went. Um, so that was a luxurious phase. That said though, we were incredibly creative because we had the freedom to do it. Um, it wasn't going to a new scenario where you're going to get the standard shot of someone at computer cutaway of, you know, computer um, keyboard cutaway of mouse. We had, we had time. Um, so I think it was, a, yeah, it was a time of luxurious creativity. The mother of Cursa had written a book. Um, and so John Harris asked me if I'd work with him on that one because it needed a delicate touch, delicate handling, because she was very close to her story, obviously, and she needed to trust whoever was going to bring that to life. Um, it was a really difficult one, because as so often happens with um, family tragedy, I think the, the statistic is that 80% of families who have a death or a loss in the family, they will separate. And so you automatically had conflict with the family. So as much as anything, I think a lot of the programs I've made, I've had to navigate very delicately family issues. And so on the one hand, you're thinking about what you're gonna film creatively. You've got the person who's not so sure about what, what they're committed to. But then you've got all these other issues around the edge and that one had police issues and um, more the sensitivities. And at that stage, no one really knew where, what had happened. You know, it was, wasn't like it was solved. Um, some of the things that we heard on the, on the ground were pretty distressing in terms of what might have happened to Kusa. And again, in that early phase, um, we didn't put those into the docker, whereas today you would, you know, it would be, everything would have been bared and out on the plate, whereas some of the things that we heard, we, we actually sort of um, tempered a little bit because the audience wouldn't have coped with it at that stage. The key was Cindy. She is fantastic, you know. I mean, Cindy is a larger than life character. Um, she had a massive um, history of abuse and just a really, um, really rough background and life. So it wasn't just about um, the weight. And that's always appealed. I don't always like multiple layers to everything that we have. We called it Cindy's Diary. We were one of the first ones to get one of the little cameras, a really exciting little little baby camera, and we gave it to Cindy to record her own diary. That, that was kind of like really new then. It was kind of really cool and, and groovy. But Cindy was um, both a delight and a nightmare to work with because she was putting us vulnerable again. I had calls at three in the morning wanting to pull out. I had all sorts of dramas with that. And again, it was staying close to the talent. And then we did a second program with Cindy because first one had been kind of superficial. It was all about losing the weight. Second one, she really revealed a whole lot of um, really deep stress in her life and that she'd been raped as a five-year-old. And um, yeah, that went a lot deeper. I had a brother that went to Auckland Grammar. He had won a scholarship to go there because we weren't from a wealthy family. And he had a phenomenal um, experience there. It was this world that no one else really understood and in Auckland particularly, well any, any city really, parents go on endlessly about what school they're going to send their child to and, and the criticism and the judgments of grammar were constant. 
So having seen it from the inside, from my brother's perspective, I was really keen to actually get inside. It actually took well over a year to convince the board again, and that was despite the fact that I had a brother who was really well respected at that school and knew numerous contacts. Um, yeah, the school was very, very nervous about um, having it covered, but their position was so strong that um, once permission was given, they are what they are. So, you know, it was the same with, with Kings and the same with um, Dilworth. You know, those three schools were very different schools. They ended up doing four boys schools in the end. Um, so, grammar had this just, this tradition that will not waver. It'll be interesting to see with new principal if it's still like that. Um, Kings was incredibly pompous and had a different view and Dilworth was for the boys the underprivileged boys and that, dare I say, that was um, very, very special film, that one, and a very, very special school, so, yeah. I think I, I got it over the line by saying, put your money where your mouth is, because you're constantly saying with this unique school and you believe in this stuff, why won't you let it be filmed then? And so I think in the end they said, yeah, well, why won't we? Um, I understand it was one of the, one of few decisions that that board that it ever come down to a really deep debate. Um, but they were really satisfied. In fact, the chair, who was really difficult and really against it, um, yeah, he actually was accepted that it was, it was something that should have happened in the end, so, yeah. I guess what appealed to me about attitude was that it was going to be, going back to those journalism things of um, standing up for others and um, advocating. But I knew as well, massive number of fantastic stories. I mean, this is a community who had been ignored by news media, um, and yet there were stunning stories. If we, if we love stories of overcoming adversity, and we love stories of the, the little hero that's popped his head up above the rest of the poppies, they're all there, and yet no one else. And I had numerous friends say to me, why would you want to do that? It's off peak, and all the rest of it. Stunning stories, and the ability to actually impact people's lives, and support families and make a difference was huge and I didn't realise quite how big that part was but we know that now that um, in terms of the scale of outcome for, from a career point of view, hugely satisfying. In New Zealand we had been covering Paralympics and it wasn't really regarded um, as a premier event. It was a little bit like you get the Olympic rights and you get Paralympics as a free gift with purchase. So as we came to know the athletes, we felt that they were not being treated as, as elite athletes and with the respect that they could. We were travelling the world with New Zealand athletes and telling their stories, and so the International Paralympic Committee recognised that actually the model of what we were doing was ensuring that there was a sustained conversation along a long period of time. We'd also just introduced our um, web platform, which meant that we had the the potential to live stream ourselves and so we had to put quite a big case to the International Olympic Committee first and then the International Paralympic Committee. Um, so huge coup um, and it felt like we said um, we just felt like the little train that could but we, having secured those rights we would never be so silly as to say hey we can do it all and so we've driven um, really hard and worked alongside TVNZ to get a really strong collaboration um, so we will deliver and produce all of the content and they will deliver the infrastructure to get the programs back from Rio. So that's a, the perfect marriage of us with our deep knowledge and them with their infrastructure. So the partnership's the key, I think, yeah. The challenging thing, I think, is the lack of respect that we've had for our work, which has been surprising. So today, even today, I think people will say, oh, you make that little program at 8.30 on a Sunday. Actually, we've won multiple international awards for our content, just so happens that um, Special Interest sits on a Sunday morning slot. The, the international audience tells us that actually we're doing good work. But that's been challenging at times. There have been times when I thought, gosh, I would love to go back and, and maybe go back into primetime docos. The thing that stops me doing that is knowing the second bit of the puzzle, which is the massive difference that we've made in people's lives. So. Um, you keep on doing it for that, but yeah.